a negotiation expert's advice on how to save the Colorado River. I don't need to win the argument. What we need to do is find the solution. On Imperfect Paradise, the Gen Z water dealmaker, wherever you get podcasts. Start your Saturday with something that will grow your kiddos' brains and get their creative juices flowing. Join us at LAS in Pasadena for a morning of multilingual readings, interactive performances, and lots of kid fun. It's Super Fun Saturday on June 1st. Get your tickets at las.com slash events. Anybody listening to this, any student journalist, don't ever let anybody tell you that what you do doesn't matter because it absolutely does matter. Because when people look back 20, 30 years from now and they want to know what was going on there, they're going to go back into our archives and they're going to look at these stories that we wrote and they're going to understand what the time was like at our campus. This is How to LA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. Today, we're putting a spotlight on journalists at Southern California colleges who've been covering protests on their campuses. Protesters have been calling for an end to Israeli attacks on Gaza and for their schools to divest from companies tied to Israel and weapons manufacturing. We heard from students at USC, UC Riverside, Cal State Long Beach, and UC Irvine about what this time has been like for them, juggling their roles as reporters, photojournalists, editors, and at the same time, college students often working alongside larger outside media organizations like us at LAist. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about being a college student and a journalist is that our role isn't as big as that of mainstream or major media outlets. On most nights, we were the only ones on site with cameras and equipment. This meant that we were able to do live coverage on our Instagram stories and even live videos, which I think today is way more accessible to a younger generation or even just those who are interested in what was happening. There's a different level of care when it comes to covering things on your own campus versus covering things just from a general lens. We're more incentivized to go out to these protests and actually talk to the people who are running these protests and get to know the reasons that they're out there and understand their perspective. This is something we heard more than once from local college journalists. And it makes sense. They're uniquely well positioned to report on important issues on their own campuses. But sometimes, they don't get the attention and respect they deserve. Recently, their coverage of the pro-Palestinian protests has highlighted the value of their work. We wanted to find out more about it, so this week, we invited three student journalists to our studios at LAist. Tell me your breakfast. I had Cheerios with blueberries. I had scrambled eggs and pancakes. Oh, you went full full menu here. I sat down with Brenda Liliana Joven from UC Riverside, Lindsay Tolls from Cal State Long Beach, and Henry Kaufman from USC. They've all been coming to protest at their schools. It was a calm semester. We were almost done. We were in final season, and things just completely changed around. Things completely ramped up. That's Henry Kaufman, a deputy photo editor with the Daily Trojan at USC. He'll be a sophomore next year. I would say tumultuous and surreal are the words I would use to describe everything that's gone on. At USC, what first got the most attention was the administration's decision to cancel the speech by this year's valedictorian. The university and Provost Andrew Guzman um, published a statement saying they were canceling Asna Tabasan's valedictorian speech, citing safety reasons after she had some pro-Palestinian views on her Instagram. And there were some pro-Israel groups that called for her recallment as valedictorian. And that so that sparked a whole wave of protests in support of Asna and trying to get the school to reinstate. And the school just kind of kept doubling down with things. The administration said there would be no speeches at graduation, then canceled the main stage graduation ceremony altogether. Pro-Palestinian demonstrators set up encampments calling for the university to divest from companies linked to the Israeli occupation in Gaza and U.S. weapons manufacturers. The administration mostly just held on strong They also decided to shut down campus to everyone other than students or faculty if you didn't have a USC ID, which did mean us at the Daily Trojan and Annenberg Media, which is the reporting done by the students in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, were the only reporters on the scene. We were the only people able to be there, which was a bit crazy. Talks broke down between protesters and administrators, and the encampments were eventually cleared out by the LAPD twice. I'm Brenda Liliana Hovell. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Highlander newspaper at UC Riverside. 
Brenda is a senior at UCR and is originally from Van Nuys. I didn't expect to be leading the newspaper with such things going on on campus, but especially since at my school, we are a relatively smaller paper. So trying to cover as much as we can with the amount of staff that we have has been kind of difficult, but I think we've made it work. UC Riverside was the first UC to come into agreement with protesters. They created this agreement with each other, the encampment and the administration. The university announced May 3rd that a deal had been struck with organizers of the Gaza Solidarity Encampment by agreeing to consider divesting from companies with ties to Israel. Administrators also agreed to fully disclose their investments and form a task force of students and faculty to explore removing endowments. And while there were no police sweeps, Brenna says that the issue isn't fully settled. Members of the campus chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine have been critical of an email Chancellor Kim Wilcox sent to UCR alumni after the agreement was reached, stating that, quote, there is no commitment to divest from anything. And at no point in the discussion did students raise the issue of divestment from Israel. They instead focused on divestment from companies engaged in weapons manufacturing and delivery. The email itself that he sent out, the statement, it seems like he's kind of denouncing everything that occurred in that agreement between the protesters and the administration. My name is Lindsay Tolles. I'm with the Daily 49er, which is the Cal State Long Beach student-run newspaper. Lindsay is a junior from Santa Clarita. Cal State Long Beach did not have an encampment, but there have been protests. And not just about Israel's war effort in Gaza. At least at CSU Long Beach, there have been protests all year, not just about Palestine, but about tuition. In the CSU system, we had the big strike with the CFA. This following semester, we had our second protest on campus for a free Palestine in May. So it was the day after the violence that took place at UCLA. Around midnight on April 30th, counter-protesters attacked pro-Palestinian protesters at UCLA. More than a dozen people were injured, including some daily Bruin student journalists. Emotions were pretty high because everybody had been, you know, glued to their phones or looking at the news. So having our protest the day after was was a bit, you know, scary, a bit intense. Um, but it was just a it was a day long protest. It was kind of a sit in thing. So they occupied Brotman Hall and the fountain area and they just kind of hung out there. They had speakers There was prayers, dancing, and things like that. Campus police and Long Beach Police Department never really got involved because there was no encampment situation. And then we had another walkout slash teach-in, and that was also very peaceful. I want to talk a little bit about your roles as young journalists. You guys are students. You guys are journalists. You guys have a campus life. Um, How do you navigate all that? Well, I think being a student journalist has kind of worked in our favor, at least in at the Daily 49er. A lot of these encampments and these protests, they're doing media blackouts. So um, a lot of them refuse to talk to media unless it's someone's um, specific job. They'll usually appoint somebody within the organization to talk to media. But you can't really go up to anybody and ask for a quote. They'll usually refuse. But being student media, you know, when when we explain, you know, we're from the Daily 49er, we are Cal State Long Beach students, I'm a student, you're a student, they usually feel more comfortable and safe talking to us. So I think that gives us an edge on other media outlets that might come to our campus to talk. Yeah, there's definitely a line of trust established between our newspapers on campus and the protesters on campus as well. And I think being open with them and genuinely taking the time to, you know, follow any guidelines that they themselves have is also just a sign of respect. Like if you give respect, you're going to gain respect in return. And I think going about that ever since the first few protests that happened in the fall and just making sure to be transparent with the protesters, that the thing that we want to do is getting their opinions, their voices in the article because they don't really have, aside from their own Instagrams, their own platforms, 
there aren't any other platforms that they can really use to showcase what they're thinking, to showcase, you know, their beliefs, their thoughts, what they want to show to the world, essentially. And I think as student journalists, we kind of have we have that responsibility of representing the student body on campus and taking the time to just sit with them and talk to them, having these natural conversations with them and developing that relationship with them can be helpful. And it definitely just it like you said, it just it makes us it makes our coverage more fruitful in that sense. I think there's a few aspects to it. One, yes, we're much closer to a lot of people. I had multiple friends who were in the encampment, multiple friends who were in the pro-Israel protests. Sometimes I get a message like, hey, just so you know, this protest is happening now. And be like, oh, great, because maybe it's hard to keep up with everything going on always. There's also the student part of it. So as I mentioned, I was at the encampment on that first day from when they started setting up, just there to cover it, except for one hour from 10 to 11, because I did still have to go to my writing 150 class, because we are still students. So trying to balance, especially in final season, six-page papers with LAPD on campus and helicopters, that was a bit chaotic. Um, And then at USC, it was a very unique thing that campus was shut down. It was Mm -hmm. only students and faculty who could be there. So that meant that we were the only people able to really report on us as an Annenberg media, which led to some crazy opportunities. I mean, like that, we were the people who these national outlets were turning to. I, I did a phone call with the Daily, the New York Times podcast. Mm-hmm. I was on KNX Radio, ABC, NBC, CBS. I just had a photo in Time magazine the other week, which was one of the most surreal things that's ever happened to me. Amazing work. Thank you. Um, but it's just really the fact that we were the only people on campus and able to cover it led to us being the people paying where people were paying attention to. And I think we've always been pretty reputable. People have paid attention to us. I like to think, but you can even just look at the Instagram followers over the last few weeks is gone up in thousands and all lies were on us, which definitely led to more pressure in many ways, but also really understanding that our photos, our reporting is what people are seeing and honored by that in a way, for lack of a better word, I guess. Mm-hmm. And something that's come up in our initial conversations about this with journalists like yourselves is what happened at UCLA, um, you know, the violent attack by counter protesters. Then the, the next day, there is a clearing of the encampment by police and riot gear and a lot of arrests. Did that change how all y'all like approach the work you were doing or thought about safety concerns or anything? It absolutely affected, I think, how we approached our our coverage because CSU Long Beach is a public campus, so anybody can walk on. And like I said, we had our protest the day after all that violence went down at UCLA. So this was like super fresh in our mind. And so we were communicating through the news team about, you know, safety. We made sure to send out, you know, a message to everybody on the on the in the newsroom, not just on news team that, you know, let us know if you're you know, sign this paper, put your name down when you think you're going to be going to the protest so that we know who on staff might be there. I slept in the office when the encampments were happening with my news editor, Mata Elangovan. And the thing that we remained with each other is that we were going to stick by each other no matter what, that we kind of developed this buddy system that, you know, one of us would be awake, the other asleep, or just making sure that we also just kept each other protected. And she's my news editor. I wanted her to be safe as well. We just wanted to make sure that both of us were safe, but also keeping in mind that if anything were to happen, try to keep a distance, but try to also just try to maintain that coverage as best as we can, because you kind of do have to put yourself out there as a journalist, but also keeping in mind the ethics of it and also just safety protocols in general. Yeah. What happened with you at UCLA was very, I think it had a, a big effect, um, not only just witnessing what was going on, but also UCLA and USC were crosstown rivals, but were also crosstown friends in many ways. Um, I know a lot of people at Daily Bruin, including people who like had to go to the hospital after that day. So that definitely hit on a more personal level as well. Safety was always a priority for us from the first day that the encampment was set up. The fact that it was a closed campus definitely reduced some of those fears for me personally. Um, we had very minor counter protests, but always safety. Even when things seemed at their calmest, we were making sure we were saying 
whatever our, our Slack message always signed off, be safe. Yeah, what I liked to tell people, because um, there's only a few paid positions, you know, at the at the student newspaper. So I was like, you know, you guys aren't getting paid for this. So, <laughs> so just prioritize your safety, you know, don't, you know, get hurt for this job because at the end of the day, you're a student and this is volunteer. <laughs> Stick around. We'll be back after this break. Support for LAist comes from Apple TV Plus, presenting Masters of the Air, starring Austin Butler and Callum Turner. From award winning executive producers Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Gary Getzman. Gold Derby hails this series a masterpiece, and Collide raves that it is spectacular. Following this podcast, you can hear remarks from stars Austin Butler, Callum Turner, and Anthony Boyle. More on Masters of the Air at fyc.appletvplus.com. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Pindarvis Harshaw, host of the Right Nowish podcast. Every week, I talk to the people who are creating art and culture and spreading it to the universe. As an artist, you always meet yourself. Every year, you're a different person. Essentially, we normalize a space where you can show up as your authentic self. Check out Right Now, rooted in California's Bay Area, speaking to you. It's so many people of color, so many queer people. It's like I'm being celebrated in my fullness. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's get back to my conversation with local college students and journalists. Henry Kaufman from USC, Brenda Hovell from UCR, and Lindsay Tolls at Cal State Long Beach. Talking about their experiences covering the recent pro-Palestinian protests on their campuses. We also heard from some other students like Tamara Almoed. She's a sophomore student journalist with Annenberg Media. And she told us that there were times she felt less respected by police as a student journalist. And also that outside news outlet didn't seem to be talking to as many students as she and her colleagues were. We have two major news, student news stations at USC, with Annenberg Media being one of them. Student journalists from both these stations, including myself, would spend hours every day at the encampment talking to members, the organizers, the media liaisons, even the counter-protesters. Most days we'd stay at the encampment until like well past midnight, just in case the USC Department of Public Safety or the LAPD would show up because you never really knew. It was always pretty sudden. So it was interesting to see that mainstream media outlets weren't doing the same. I asked Brenda, Lindsay, and Henry if they felt similarly. Here's Brenda first. For UCR, there were, in the first few days of the encampment, there were outside news organizations from major media companies. And what we saw in their coverage is that they, like it was said, like it was mentioned, they're not really taking the time to speak to students as much as the student journalists are trying to. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I saw, especially a lot in the coverage from larger media corporations, is that they aren't showing what's happening in the encampments as well. Because... They are essentially showing what's happening after or when things go out of hand. And I think for us, we, our newspaper wanted to really showcase what the students were doing in the encampment. Some were literally just studying for midterms because we were in midterm season during that time. Those stories, that part of the encampment isn't being shown at a larger end. And I think that's where we come in to basically show what's happening in there, what's really happening in there with students are fighting for and what they're doing just every day in the encampment. I mean, I can also elaborate on that. Um, speaking to USC, I thought that was very well said and very true. And one thing that we re- we really noticed this on that early morning when LAPD came in and completely sweeped the encampment, we were standing out there, 50 or more LAPD just show up. We were a bit caught off guard. We, had a f- we kind of thought they were going to come tonight, but we didn't know when, so we just saw cars coming in. And then they tried to put us in this media viewing area, which was... This area away from everything, like if you you, ha- you would have to have an insane lens to see it. Reporters without a camera obviously couldn't see or hear what was going on. Asking for an information officer, they would not give one to us. And then after all that happened, when things had been cleared out and LAPD was leaving, broadcast media was allowed on campus for that. Uh, media relations let other media come in that morning, and. One of the broadcasters was live on air and said that there was a statement from USC. And we were all very confused because we had not heard of the statement. So we went up to Media Relations, who was on scene, and we're like, can we have this statement as well? And they said, no, we're still working on it. Well, they just broadcast it live on air. Hmm. So they were giving it to the broadcast media, um, letting the broadcast media kind of go places where they told us not to go. And considering also how much work we had done leading up to that, and I feel like proven ourselves in many ways, 
if for some reason they didn't believe in us as journalists beforehand, that was especially, it, it affected a lot of us. And we were really, we just thought it was very interesting that they would give it to broadcast media to air, but say also to us that it's not ready. We got it later, just like 20 minutes later, maybe, but both from LAPD and from USC Media Relations, we were seeing those kind of biases towards mainstream media. I feel like we kind of have an opposite experience where in the times that I've talked to University Police Department or reached out and asked for a statement, they're usually really fast and willing to give that to us because we're the Daily 49 or we're the student newspaper. They, um, I think they feel more comfortable giving it to us knowing that we're, you know, kind of a smaller audience. Our audience is students. You know, we're not going to really take their words and broadcast them, you know, on on live television and things like that. So there's that level of um, underestimating sometimes um, our reach, but sometimes it works in our favor because they feel like they can they can give us more information. I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I was class of 2012 and I was a student journalist as well um, at Cal State Northridge, School Matadors. Um, <laughs> and one of our biggest stories, uh, aside from tuition hikes um, and other types of protests, was the Occupy movement. Um, you know, there was an encampment on campus, but there was, you know, I was also covering the encampment here in downtown L.A. Um, and that was a worldwide movement, right, that these Occupy encampments were all over the world. Um, that was that era made me feel like I can do this. Like, I love telling stories. Like, I definitely want to continue being a journalist. How about you guys? Does this make you want to continue with journalism? Or is it kind of like, all right, I had a taste of it. I kind of want to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I think these last few weeks for me, I've definitely seen that I do want to be a journalist in the future. I, I was more on the editing side, being more of behind the scenes in the newsroom and just kind of editing articles, assisting with them. But being actively in those protests, covering them has shown me that there's a strength in unity. And what I've seen in my peers of people of my generation, younger and older too, it's, I would say, I'm not sure if... I think the word is beautiful, I would want to say for it, is that it's just very empowering to see them join in these causes and working together as a collaborative effort. And I think that's something that needs to be emphasized, that this is a collective, you know, student nationwide thing that's an issue that's going on. So short answer, yes, I do want to continue in journalism. Um, I feel the same way. I think... um you know, the college experience, it's its trying to throw reasons at you to not want to continue doing journalism, you know, from all the protests and strikes and everything that's happened. You can start to feel burnt out, you know, covering stuff. And you're like, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my <laughs> life? But um, I think it is. And I think it takes, you know, a special I think it takes a certain kind of person to, you know, go through that and still want to keep doing it. So it's, you know, it's definitely for me. It might not be for somebody else, but, you know, going to these protests and things like that, it's just like, yeah, I'm, I like this. I want to keep doing this. And you, you haven't swayed me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Um, I've had a very interesting semester. I'll say I'm not a journalism major. I had never done journalism, taken a photo for journalism before this semester. Um, I'm a cinema and media studies major. I have always wanted to go into film production, and I still really very much do. I, I love film production and telling stories through that medium. But this has confused me, I guess, because now <laughs> there's something else that I really like to do. Um, I'm contemplating my entire life since I was a child. Um, <laughs> existential crisis. But so it's thrown my life in shambles, but in the best way possible, I think. Opening up new doors and allowing me to see these new possibilities that I never dreamed of previously. Yes, join the dark side. <laughs> uh, well, on behalf of professional journalists out there, I just want to say thanks for doing the job that sometimes even professional journalists don't do, like sticking around at four in the morning or... <laughs> Maybe being a writer who's not getting paid for their work, being published in the newspaper or, you know, sleeping in a newsroom <laughs> because that's the only way you're getting updates. So um, thanks for the work you've been doing and, and been putting on those hours. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks for coming on to How to LA. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you for having us. And before we go... 
we wanted to include some more perspectives from other students we talked to or who sent us voice memos sharing some of their experiences. Sina Omar is a managing editor of The Highlander at UC Riverside. She's from Redlands, and next year she will be their editor-in-chief. I haven't really covered protests in the past, but in regards to the pro-Palestine protest, I think I had a unique perspective to bring to this table because originally my family is from Palestine and Morocco, um, so I consider myself to be Palestinian and Moroccan. There's a different level of care when it comes to covering things on your own campus versus covering things just from a general lens. We're more incentivized to go out to these protests and actually talk to the people who are running these protests and get to know the reasons that they're out there and understand their perspective. A lot of times we, as student reporters, have spoken with these students countless times before going and covering an event and they're comfortable with us being there because we go and we talk to them and they try to understand our stories and they know that the angle that we're coming from is one of genuine interest. I do want to go into journalism and writing because I feel like my own community is misrepresented in news. I want to be kind of a voice or a beacon for them. And I think that my passion for this particular field, as well as what I want to do within it, has only grown as a result of covering these protests. We also heard from Emily Takahashi at UCI. I'm a campus news staff writer at the New University. And so here at UCI, um, all the protests came to a culmination last week. On May 15th, law enforcement officials cleared out the student encampment at UC Irvine. Police made 47 arrests, the majority of which were for failure to disperse and a few for trespassing. I knew we had to be the first on the scene to make sure people knew what was going on. Yeah, we started live streaming around 3 o'clock on our Instagram, and we ended the live, I ended up live stream around 9.30. Um, I held the live stream the entire time, only stopping when um, the phone died or um, we had to relocate. But we made sure that people, even if they weren't there, could see what was going on. Emily also saw one of her professors who was participating in the protest get arrested. There was a professor that was arrested who was actually the professor that whose class I had left um, at 2.50. So we both left the same classroom to go to the same place to do different things. And I saw him get arrested and the next day saw a headline by one of those larger media corporations. Um, the headline was, they were anti-Israel agitators claiming to be professors. Um, and it had a photo of my professor on there, and like clearly if I had taken one look at that, I would have known that's my professor and he, he works here. The article was an online post from Fox News. And in that way, we, I saw the industry that I want to go into, but I also saw how it can fail. That was just inaccurate reporting, and I don't know how it changed um, the narrative of what happened on our campus, but... It definitely skewed it. Finally, Anthony Orico, who we heard from at the very top of this episode, he's a senior at Cal State Long Beach. This year, he was an assistant news editor at the Daily 49er. A lot of people try to play off student journalism. It's not really, it's, oh, this is just, you know, an extracurricular kind of activity. It's, it's like a club, you know, not, it's just not really a lot of taking it very seriously in my eyes, but this, whole ordeal has really like re-inspired me to be very hopeful about the future of journalism because the amount of coverage that I've seen from papers all across the country and our own paper is just it's so professional it's so just amazing to see it from people who probably are, they're not being paid for this more than likely they're doing classes along with all of this reporting and it's really inspiring <laughs> Alrighty, y'all, that is it for us today. Thank you so much to all the students who took their time to share their stories with us. You can find more about their work at alayas.com. We'll be back next week with new episodes for you, and I hope you have a great holiday weekend. Stay safe, y'all. This episode was produced by Monica Bushman. Our Hot to LA team also includes Erica Washington, Evan Jacoby, Mangy Botel, and Victoria Alejandro. Our executive producer is Megan Larson, and our engineer is Hasmik Pagosian. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Support for LAist comes from Apple TV Plus, presenting Masters of the Air. Austin Butler stars as Major Gale Buck Clevin. He was one of the best pilots. Some say he was the best pilot, and they 
in the eighth, and he was a man of few words and a man of action. A remarkable, intelligent guy who went on to also fly in Korea and, and Vietnam. And, and I think we've tried to portray him as, as true to life as possible. You go up for eight hours, say, and you don't know if you're going to come back. Sometimes it's the most horrific things you've ever seen. And then you come back and people are wearing suits and ties and or they're going to London and they're getting a hamburger and they're meeting women and they're having a party and then you go up and you do it again day after day of that. I think that definitely it, that has a bizarre psychological toll. Anthony Boyle, who plays reluctant navigator Lieutenant Harry Crosby, explains the physical demands on the actors. There's a plane on a massive sort of crane kind of thing, and you sort of get loaded up, and it's a tiny little sort of door that you have to get through, and you've got all the sort of the gear on, and you get so hot up there that we had these things that F1 drivers wear, these like vests, cooling vests. You sort of plug them in, and then you're up there all day. It was tough at times. You're up there for, you know, seven hours, and there's four or five fixed cameras in the plane, 360 degree screen around you. You can't get in or out because it takes so long to get the gimbal up. So it was, um, I was going to say it's like it was a lot of fun, but it wasn't. It was, it was grueling at times. Like the rest of the cast, Callum Turner, who stars as Major John Bucky Egan, was thrilled to work with the same executive producer team behind the Emmy-winning Band of Brothers and The Pacific. Well, it's just really exciting, actually, because... It's what you want to do, you know? You want to be working with people that inspire you. We've got four, five really incredible directors, you know, who've made beautiful, beautiful pieces of work. And to represent the Air Force, the Air Corps, it's a real privilege, you know? These are real people who sacrifice their lives and you are responsible for telling their story, you know? You're responsible for the souls of these men. And uh, I think Austin and I, felt that. Gold Derby hails this series as a masterpiece. More on Masters of the Air at fyc.appletvplus.com.